Tom, I'd like to talk to you about nappy time. <laughs> My favorite time. When's the last time you slept? Last night. <sighs> Dodged a bullet. That was number one. You passed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're going into debunction junction, though, because as it turns out, people are fooling themselves about sleep. So I would like to challenge you uh, and your beliefs about sleep and what they do for your health, your body, and your anxiety. Can we do that? Absolutely. Conjunction junction. No, debunction uh, junction. Debunction junction. Yeah, I'm very what excited about this. So the, the whole premise is that what you believe about sleep, well says Sandy Lamott of CNN, mm. maybe nothing but a pipe dream. Oh, no, Sandy. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. right. So the first one is, how much time do you believe the average adult needs to get in bed asleep per night? Six to eight hours. Oh. I've always been told eight. Like, that's what wow. I learned growing up. It was supposed to be eight hours, right? In fact, this was a problematic assumption, the number one most problematic assumption that they found. Uh, Rebecca Robbins is the lead investigator at the uh, Department of Population Health at NYU. And uh, she said here that it, it turns out ad most adults in the survey believed that they need five hours or less of sleep a night. And it turns out that is dramatically incorrect. And in fact, we need more sleep. The, the older you get, you need more sleep. Now, that usually goes head to head uh, against hormone changes in your body. And right. you might naturally be getting less sleep and it's harder to stay asleep, but it makes it all the more important that you do the right things to make sure that you're getting a healthy amount of sleep. And eight hours is still that's the that's the norm. That's what you should be shooting for. Get in bed. I wonder why I know that and other people don't. It's just I guess that's, I was just taught it. Yeah, it's I always guess been that's how. Eight hours think, of sleep. Yeah. yeah I don't usually you. get eight hours of sleep, but that's the aim. I'm like 12, 13. What? <laughs> Naturally. Let's see how you do on the rest of the quiz. Yep. It's healthy to be able to fall asleep anywhere, anytime. True or false? True, but I have no confidence in it. I'm just sort of picking one. Yeah, no, that's that's good that you uh, couched it in failure because it's wrong. Okay. It is not healthy to be able to fall asleep anywhere, anytime. People call it their superhero power. Oh, put me on a plane or a train, I fall right to sleep. But you know yeah. what the truth is? A well-rested person is not able to do that. An exhausted person oh, is able to do totally that. that totally makes sense. Of course, if, you're, if your tank always wants to be filled up, that means it's empty that didn't that's need to right be said. <laughs> robin says if you're following into falling into micro sleeps or mini sleep episodes it means your body's so exhausted that whenever it has a moment it's going to start to repay its sleep debt very Ugh. unhealthy sleep behavior how about this one your brain and body can adapt to less sleep true or false I want to say true but I bet the idea is false yeah it is because you should be seeing a pattern <laughs> to my rigorous line of inquiry, mostly. Uh, it, it turns out a good night's sleep gives your sleep cycle time to repeat. There are four distinct phases of sleep, and it repeats this cycle over and over. And the more times you can get through the REM sleep stage, uh, the more uh, you are able to recharge your brain and body. How about this one? Mm. Snoring, although annoying, is mostly harmless. True or false? I think I've been reading that snoring is a bad time. Like it's false that it's very that it can be very dangerous. Yes, in fact, it's not only dangerous; it's it, it is exhausting to your body. It is physically exhausting, and it it makes your sleep less rest less restful uh, because you're waking you yourself up. Uh, well, yeah, it's just because your body is doing more, right? It's it is sure. uh, much more active. It also increases risk for just a few things uh, in in the rogues gallery of uh, anxiety driven uh, physical symptoms like heart attacks, atrial fibrillation, asthma, high blood pressure, glaucoma, cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, and uh. cognitive and behavioral disorders. Tom. And All of those from things. your wife, am I right, Pete? Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> and how? <laughs> Remembering your dreams is a sign of good sleep. How about that? True or false? Oh, that's neat. I remember them when I wake up, but then by about halfway through breakfast. 
mm-hmm. they're kind of gone. Like I can yeah. just remember and, a unless you sit down so and write them good? down and yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's a myth. Says uh, uh, says the study because all of us do experience dreams four to five times a night and we don't remember because we've not woken up or disrupted our sleep. Uh, if you have a dream with strong emotional context, it may come back to uh, it come back to you at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon when you have some downtime and relax. Right, that context sensitive mm. uh, memory, but uh, it is not uh, it is not a sign of good sleep. It is neither or it doesn't. Oh, doesn't I would have gotten matter. that one wrong. So, there you go. So, uh, myths about sleep. Keep your body healthy and happy, and you you will be able to stave off the ill effects of uh, you know of uh, aging and uh, anxiety as long as you do those things and stop believing stupid things. <laughs> well, that can solve a <laughs> lot of problems, Pete. <laughs> yeah, I'll put that on my list. <laughs> Welcome to What's That Smell, a sometimes funny podcast about humans and their anxieties. I'm Tommy Metz III. And I'm Pete Wright. And every week, we each drag one of our deepest, darkest anxieties into the light to share it, learn about it, and hopefully laugh about it with all of you. Reach out to us. This third season's almost over, but there's still time. Send us the story of your anxieties to something stinky at what's that smell.net again something stinky at what's that smell.net uh with that pete i will go first Pete, only two episodes left of this season and to celebrate i got a weird one i'm delighted (laughs) It is not incapacitating in my life, but when I think about it, it literally gives me the willies. Uh, To start, I would like you and our listeners to listen to a short TV clip. Uh, Here you go. I've given up drinking. I've given up drugs. Greta taught me there's two things you never give up. One's rock and roll. The other's a source. Greta Sims. (laughs) Great memory, Greta. I only hope you can adjust to the lack of stress in your... Fletch? Fletch? Fletcher? 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 Honey? Sweetie? Are you okay? Are you okay? I flung the investment. (laughs) (laughs) What did you say? Among the investment, <laughs> well, well, I can sign. Why well, can sign? I'll call nine one one. It's proficient. Why get it's Doctor fun. House? Uh-oh. Somebody get Doctor House. Yeah, that was from the second season, episode 10 of the second season of a show called House MD. Uh, the show was called Failure to Communicate. For those that don't know, House MD was a very popular medical drama starring Hugh Laurie as an irascible but brilliant doctor and his team of specialists who diagnose and treat rare disorders. In the clip you just heard, actually, would you mind describing what just well, we have a culture. gentleman who I think we think is a recovering alcoholic and drug addict, and he's uh, he's saying goodbye to a colleague. Uh, it's he's raising a glass. <laughs> it's like a goodbye thing at the end of a, a work event, and he raises a glass of something presumably non-alcoholic, and he says, uh, yep. "You know, here's to you." And then he just falls over and falls on the ground. And when he wakes up, when they they gather around him, "Are you okay, Fletcher? Are you okay?" He says, you know, that he he says like nonsense words, nonsense words substituted for real ones. Exactly right. Um, And it's hard to see in the clip and it's hard for the listeners to see anything (laughs) because you just watch the clip. They just listen to it. Uh, It's hard to see. But he did hit his head on the desk on the way down. That's important. Eventually, he is diagnosed with what? Aphasia. 
Aphasia, correct, such a smarty, which is an impairment of language caused by injury to the brain, usually due to a stroke, but it can also result from head trauma, brain tumors, or infections. So back to me. Why am I so obsessed with this episode? I saw this episode on January 10th, 2006. I've watched it many times since. I kind of can't stop yeah. thinking about it because aphasia, to me, sounds like an absolute personal yeah. nightmare. My ability to communicate, I think, is the single most important thing in my life. Uh, all the different ways I make my living hinge on making speeches, teaching, performing, directing others, and being unable to communicate sounds like a living hell. Another thing he tries, they try to communicate with him through drawing and his drawing and writing is equally, he thinks it yeah. looks great. He's like hundred percent and it's just scribbles and nonsense. Um, so yeah, aphasia is you think you're able to understand other people and you think you're talking great and everything's uh, five by five and instead it's just a bunch of hamster mice and toilet paper <laughs> and stuff like that and you flung the uh, investment so, like fletcher did yeah and he's tabling pete uh it seemed like when you were listening to the clip i could sort of hear you shaking your head is this something that you know about and have little well you have to about? understand Tommy, that I uh, am, in, am married to and uh, was partner to during her graduate school experience, a speech and language pathologist. And right. so there are no end to the communication anxieties <laughs> that sprung up when she was going through her program and would come home and say, hey, look at this. It's a guy with like rebar through his brain and look what it did to his speech center. And like, crazy things Ooh. that would send me you know to wonderful places and 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 so but for me like aphasia is at the top of the list of of funky like communication disorders that freak me out so i totally resonate with this it's not one i think about every day and and frankly there's there's one actually that tops that which i i should save for another episode because oh really okay is it a different kind of aphasia no, cuz there are a couple it's not. different kinds i want of you aphasia. to own no. aphasia for me it involves some more mechanics that well, i don't like to think Ugh. about ah <laughs> um yeah, no, I completely agree. I am not currently married to a speech therapist currently. <laughs> uh, but looking. Yeah, but <laughs> but fingers crossed. But personal experience, I've just had sometimes, I had kind of a bad voice and throat growing up. What do you mean? It was just like misbehaved? Yeah, it was just real sassy. No, I was told, I at one point I had severe strep throat that led to laryngitis for a few oh. weeks. I completely lost my voice and couldn't talk at all. And um, trying to speak made my eyes water. I couldn't stand it. I could, unlike Fletcher, uh, I could communicate on paper. Uh, and, well, I'm sure listeners to the show will surely disagree. I fancy myself to be fairly quick-witted. That's very important to me. Uh, I know there is no, no evidence of that on what's that smell. Uh, but none of that quick-wittedness works on paper in yeah. the moment. And also related to voice, just one other thing. As a teenager, I went and saw an ear, nose, and throat specialist that told me I talked and sang incorrectly in a way that was damaging to my vocal cords and that there was a chance I would lose the ability to speak by age 35. What? what? None of that came to fruition. I'm not convinced he was a doctor. We just never went back to him. And we saw another doctor. He's like, yes, the way that you talk, you're putting strain on you. So you're just going to have more sore throats and lose your voice easier than other people. But you're going to talk and fine and don't go to weird doctor in a cave Did, anymore. Has that, has that uh, been so, true over the course of your life? The sore throats? Yes. Because we know, okay, because we know one doctor was wrong because you're still speaking, <laughs> but the other doctor was at right. least to some degree right. Yeah, it's pretty easy for me to lose my okay. voice. Okay, so I'm um, sorry. I, I want to get back to this aphasia thing, but what have you done to like fix that? Like, do have you nothing? nothing. Because, okay, because you don't care. You don't <laughs> care. The time, right. no, time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even you don't care. Uh uh. I'm trying to get on my own episode of House MD. <laughs> what? It's canceled? Damn. Okay, okay. Go okay. on about your thing. <laughs> so, in a way, it's always been in the back of my mind. Um, it is, unfortunately, fairly common with over 200,000 cases reported a year. Out of all the people in the United States, that's not a lot, but that is considered mm -hmm. common. With the vast majority of people 60 years and older, it can fix itself, which is what happens with Fletcher in the episode, like a light switch turning back on. But we can't fix it. We can't go in and flip that switch. Only speech therapy mm -hmm. is offered. That's also the scary part. I was hoping that they can sort of rewire your brain, but no, you just sort of have to learn and communicate mm -hmm. with pictures 
that someone else gives you instead of just normal things. And that's really, I mean, that just sounds like something that's like a time bomb just waiting to go off. And I think that that's really scary because I talk a lot. Boy, that's the truth. <laughs> I talk all the time. <laughs> and it's very important. And I talk very fast. And I already sometimes, like, I know that there's things like sundowning and Alzheimer's and stuff. I haven't had a ton of experience with it with people in my life, which is nice. Um, and I'm not trying to go too far down that road because that's just a so a small, sad slog. Yeah. Oh, S's. Uh, but it is just very worrisome to me. It's any of those things like where like physiologically it feels to me like there is a single point of failure. Like I, I'm right with you. I have made a career out of talking on a microphone. And what happens if I, for example, fall during an earthquake and I land on a curb and I destroy my jaw and my teeth? Yeah, what happens? Nothing. What am I going to do? Podcast? No, I'm not going to podcast. No podcast. No. You could do ASMR, I bet. Just all of the, no, it'd just be all the clicking sounds that come out of the, like, yeah. Like you wouldn't be saying anything, but you just sort of be like, ah, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You'd be like a beatbox, yeah. only not for music, <laughs> just all of, for sadness. Uh, this whole, yeah. like, this whole journey we're taking right now is the worst. <laughs> I would like to rerail, please. <laughs> there are different kinds of aphasia and just in case people are interested i just wanted to list just two of them uh Braca's aphasia is involves damage to the frontal lobe of the brain uh these individuals frequently speak in short meaningful phrases that are produced unfortunately with a great amount of effort uh thus characterized as non-fluent aphasia uh, affected people omit small connecting words like is and and the so the person uh, on the website that i had the example they give is walk dog. And if they say walk dog, that could mean I will take the dog for a walk or you take the dog for a walk or the dog walked out of the yard. <laughs> Does or the dog know how to just, walk? Or just walk dog. I mean, I, maybe you're just keeping things moving. Yeah. Depending on the circumstances. Um, oh, one other one is Wernicke's aphasia. Mm -hmm. They, that's the big one. They speak in really long sentences that have no meaning, add unnecessary words, and even create new words. The example, the same website, they're really about dog walking. Uh, someone with Wernicke's aphasia would say, you know that Smoodle Pinkard and that I want him, get him round and take care of him like you want before. And that means the dog needs to go out so I will take him for a walk. Wow. Yeesh. That dog's never going <laughs> So. <laughs> Wait, now, is there a, is, you just said that as if somebody had translated it like google translate translate that or what how this is all from this aphasia website it's all uh, the good news about aphasia can you decode it oh okay you know that smoodle pinkard and that i want to get him around and take care of him like you want before the dog needs to go out, so I will take him for a walk. 100% no. Okay, that's what I was I wondering. Like, is there a way? So, uh, did you, uh, did you, in your yes, research? Yes, in the episode. No, I'm no, going no. Back, in the research. <laughs> I mean, in the research, not just the house episode that I watched. The same words mean the same things. Okay, that was my question. And thank you for answering it because I feel like I had a little aphasia just now. Right. Because <laughs> you can decode it in a way because um, if you say the aforementioned, Toilet that smoodle pinkard hat. or yeah if you want a smoodle pinkard that will mean dog to you every time every time yes that's a, because so it's not a temporary we rewiring that changes all the time it's a it's a permanent for lack of a better phrase rewiring of words to symbols now hearing Something you like say that. that i'm going to take back and say i'm not sure because it does get better if the light goes on it doesn't just click things mm -hmm. get better and better as they go so probably it is a lot more fluid yeah right um and harder well, we to don't decode. have to worry because my wife is going to listen to this yeah she's going to tell us if we're right so, yeah yeah it's i know stakes are high she's not gonna don't worry it'll right. be about three months yeah so. <laughs> good point <laughs> uh there are the good news is there are there's a ton of support out there. Aphasia and Google is links and links and links and links. Yeah. There is a very big community out there. There's a lot of people. We know a lot more about it than we used to. And there's actually a lot of famous people that have had it. Have it or have had it. Would you like to know three? Steven Spielberg. Tom mm -hmm. Hanks. No. Dusty no. Rhodes. No. What was the third one? Dusty Rhodes? Close. Yeah. Randy Travis. There we go. Country singer Randy Travis is able to sing a little, but since a stroke that he had, he is still unable to speak. Or really? Speak like correctly. right now? Right now. Correct. 
I had no idea. That's why he sort of disappeared a little bit. I didn't know he disappeared. He's sort of making, meaning out of the public eye. Yeah. He was an enormous hit. He had that enormous hit of Forever and Ever Amen, and now he's, it's not going as well. Yeah. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, as he got older. He did disappear. And this is the one that I wanted to end on because it's good news. Amila Clark, also known <laughs> as the Mother of Daenerys Dragons. Daenerys Targaryen. Game of Thrones, exactly uh. right. My Khaleesi. After the first season, she suffered an aneurysm that left her unable to communicate in, except for nonsense for two whole weeks. Obviously, she has made a full swimming recovery. That's one of those of the light just sort of came back on once blood yeah. was able to be able to move around her brain. I mean, she's got dragon speech. She's doing fine. She's got dragon. It was the dragons. I think. Can you imagine what this show would have been like? Probably not a whole lot different if they just let her keep going. Yeah, because I can't understand anyone when they're talking with all those beards and those. (laughs) Look at those coats. But going over it, doing the research, and actually talking about it has made me feel a little bit better. I think this is something that has sort of been in my haunted house for a long time, and I've never. This is the first time I've ever talked about my fear of aphasia, Um, and. I do have anxiety over it, but I know that we're getting better and better at it. And until that day comes, and it will, Pete, I'm going to use my ability to communicate to figure out what that smell is. (laughs) Are you with me? (laughs) Oh, it's regret of the week time, Pete. Uh, And this Mm. actually, this didn't happen last week. This happened many years ago, but it's still right up there because I go to a lot of theater. I go to a lot of shows and I think of it pretty much every time. And it gives me a little anxiety. This is in the to be filed under laughing in church department. Uh, I was with friends and we were at the Disney concert hall seeing a choral concert that was raising money for schools in the area. I don't like where this is going. (laughs) And there was a huge, all the choirs came out for this one. It was an original song that one of the parents had written, I think. And it was the most (laughs) tortured, uh, like, analogy, simile situation that I'd ever seen. Because they were talking about it started, it was like a sea shanty. And then they'd be like, put up the, oh, what was it? Let's see. Put up the sails of your mind and catch the (laughs) wind of knowledge. And it kept getting worse and worse. And then at one point, the sails, like the water was now knowledge and the sails was something else. So I'm like giggling, like behind my hands uh, because it's very quiet in the thing. And so... And I'm like, oh, this is so bad. This is so bad. This is so bad. And then, and then here's the bridge. Are you ready? This is this whole time we've been on a ship of learning, right? The bridge, they finally just go, public schools, public schools. <laughs> what? And then silence. That's like this big cutout. And I go, ha! And just start laughing. <laughs> I have to duck down in my seat and then finally down to the floor because I can't stop laughing. Everybody looked at us, Pete. There was no hiding. And my friends are still mad at me to this day. <laughs> so I, that was the regret ship. The ship of learning. Public schools, public schools. A little bit surprised you don't have new friends now, Tom. <laughs> Well, here's something you won't regret, Tom. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial to explore the entire, the depths. You can plumb the depths of the surface, service of audible.com. If you visit audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast, there are over 200 trillion books, as many stars busy. in our solar system. <laughs> In, and in, they're everywhere. They're for your your phone and your uh, Kindle device and your other Square MP3 player. You you can get books for it. Uh, and for you, listeners of What's That Smell, all you have to do is visit audibletrial.com slash send of a podcast, search for the book you would like to get for free, and download it. That's all you have to do. And you can go to sleep tonight and you can feel comfortable. You can bask in the warmth of knowing that you have just supported the What's That Smell podcast. Now, I would like to recommend a book uh, to you that uh, is a little bit, I'm going to call it foreshadowing tonight. Oh. Uh, if, if you'd like to if you'd like to go with me on this uh, journey. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is an unexpected journey, Tom. I would like to recommend The Hobbit as narrated by Martin Shaw. Now, what I have discovered 
about these Audible books is that the reason they have more than 200 trillion books is because many of them have been audibleized multiple times. Right. If you go yeah. looking for The Hobbit, you'll get all kinds of versions in English and then French and then German. You want to look for the one by Martin Shaw because he is one hell of a narrator. I'm I'm telling you the truth. He is fantastic with the fantastic. He's fantastic at tasket <laughs> with it uh, with the uh, uh, the Tolkien. Fantastic with the Tolkien. <laughs> ah, Phasia. <laughs> Anyhow. You should check this out. Uh, it's the story of our friend uh, uh, Bilbo and his uh, journey, an unexpected journey. And it's just terrific. Uh, audibletrial.com slash scent of a podcast. You'll have a fantastic time. <laughs> Tom, how do you feel about your future? Hmm, so bright. Got to wear them. Is em. it? You got to wear them. Got to wear Look, shades. There's there's a lot coming in the future. <laughs> yes, <And> everything. <laughs> it's a little bit it it's a little bit scary, but from where I sit day to day, I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. And then I got this listener submission and all I can feel is anxiety and regret. Oh, May I no. share it with you? <laughs> Absolutely. Please do. Hi, fellas. Been listening to you guys across your shows for some time now and thought it finally time to share briefly what I'm going through these days. I found you through the ADHD podcast and quickly jumped into the next reel. So for purposes of the show, you can call me Bilbo, <laughs> a delightful reference to one of my favorite book series and Tommy's love of, quote, fake things, throwing things at fake things on film. <laughs> This guy's a listener right here. He really is a super fan. I was diagnosed with ADHD the day after I turned 50. Mm. It has been well over a decade since that diagnosis, and it's put an awful lot into focus for me. But now I'm staring into a new abyss. It's time for me to retire. Oh, sure. I'm leaving work this coming Friday as I write this, and I won't be returning. I'm sure my team has prepared some sort of going away event, and as kind as that is, I'm a bit numb to it all. All the literature says I should have started easing into retirement years ago, but I didn't do that. I feel like I'm running headlong into a brick wall with no helmet, and I just can't stop my legs. There's all the predictable factors rolled mm. in there. Sustainable income, health care, mobility, but the biggest thing that wears me down right now is this. How the hell am I going to contribute? when I don't really have anything to contribute to. I know you guys aren't there yet, but I suppose I'm just eager to hear you make this constant fear maybe just a little bit funny. <laughs> all that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. Bilbo. Wow. Thank you, Bilbo. Right? We appreciate right? you. Yeah, that's... I heard Fred Jones Part 2 by Ben Folds playing that entire time. That's a reference for, like, one person. Okay. Right. That's, um, it's a great album. Yeah, thank you so much for submitting. Yeah, I mean, I have seen many movies and many TV shows about just this. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, it's, I'm actively it, watching my father, after he retired, not be retired. <laughs> like, he is on... Tons of different boards. He is a board of directors on stuff. Like he, he still does consulting. Like he is actively not retiring. I'm just sort of seeing it. Yeah, right. And that's the thing that I think is, I, and I wonder how much of this is a cultural thing, right? Because uh, my memory of what happens when you retire from when I was a kid and like grandparents, I guess, would retire. My grandparents died when I was young, so I didn't have that. But, you know, friends, grandparents and, you know, parents, when they they stopped working was they they stopped working and it was like you know and it's all ships uh, and palm, models palm tree shirts and you know drinks with umbrellas right it, that's the dare to dream kind of version of retirement we're all going to move to an island somewhere and uh, drink things out of coconuts <laughs> um and and i don't i don't not only do i not see that hmm. anymore i don't i don't think young people envision that's what retirement looks like anymore I Is don't think young people envision retirement. 
<laughs> the way things are going, I think it's just <laughs> cradle to grave at this point. Yeah, once you learn about retirement, it's already too late. Kids, right. Don't worry. Uh, well, Bilbo, again, first and foremost, you you are not alone. In 2016, mm-hmm. Chris Hogan uh, commissioned a study for the Dave Ramsey Group. You know Dave. Yeah. <laughs> if you're if you're retiring, you know Dave Ramsey, uh, and uh, and he learned predictably that a lot of us are worried about retirement. And here's what their numbers say: 56 percent of Americans lose sleep thinking about their retirement, mm. and they say that they are anxious about that chapter of their lives. 61 percent of people who are actively saving for retirement lose sleep because it's on their minds, compared to 49 percent of people who aren't putting any money away. Mm. So that's the financial stress, and I love it that the people who are fully ostriching have no problems at all with fear sure. of retirement. <laughs> <laughs> that, that may be the most important thing we learn out of this. Uh, and 80% of those who feel ashamed, guilty, or embarrassed about retirement stay up at night thinking about it. So there mm. are a lot of people who feel uh, ashamed, guilty, and embarrassed uh, about the fact that they're retiring and they don't know what to do, Right. Right. And I think it's nice to see that it's really not just about the money. That's where my uh, personal fear is, is are we saving enough for retirement? Is there, because I don't know how long we're going to live after I stop being sort of working. Uh, You know, they, these are sort of the emotional issues that come uh, with retirement. Like we're, we're sort of saving, but not without any intention. And that causes stress because we don't have a plan. Right. Is what the research says. If you are if you're going into this future retirement without having thought about what your future is going to look like, that causes self-spiraling, self-defeating fear of future. But looking it right in the face is tough. Yeah. I mean, because I can definitely relate to the idea. Relate is a strong word, but that his seems to come more from feeling like you're a contributing member and just of time. That's a lot of time now. And yeah. it can seem like, especially because it's such a uh, immediate change when it happens, that it can be like a lot of time to be staring down the barrel at. So I get it. The prevailing stress that comes with retirement is is that the Friday last day of work party <laughs> represents the end, right? And it's the end of that major chapter. It's the end of financial accumulation. Like, where am I going to get any new money to contribute to all these great things I've been saving for if I've been saving for them? Uh, the end of contribution, right? That sort of intellectual and emotional space where you're you're doing something. You've spent decades working towards something. And I think it's easy to see that retirement party as like crossing a weird, dark finish line. Right. The last page of a book, like you turn it, then what? Mm. Then what do you do? Uh, and and so I, I think that's um, I think that's pretty grim. But I also think that there's great opportunity. And the only models that I have are, you know, that I can talk to are my folks uh, and, and in particular, my wife's parents, who I think have retired exceptionally well. Mm. How so? Uh, well, they were both um, uh, special ed- educators, right? They were in in counseling departments in schools, uh, elementary, middle, high schools uh, for years, and they just did the smart thing. They listened to their financial advisor and they put away as much as they could while they were working, and they ended up with a great pension. And they're sort of the dream case, you okay. know what I mean? Like, yeah, they just did it right, and n- then they retired, and the pension kicked in, and now they're going on, you know. A, a decade of having been able to travel and see the world and do it smartly and downsize their home and uh, do all of those things. But uh, that was always part of their plan. And Mm. I remember before they retired, having them talk about, you know, when we quit working, we have set aside and we've told our financial advisor, this is how we would like to spend our time. Please ensure we can afford that. Got right? it. Please yeah. ensure that we're ready for that. Please ensure that I'm ready to pick up some new camera gear because that's a hobby I would like to take on. Please ensure that I have the resources I need to write a book. Please ensure that I have what I need to do to uh, begin teaching, to begin giving back, mm-hmm. to begin doing the kinds of things that I, I feel like I was too busy working to do in a way. Uh, and, and I think that is, I find that a super optimistic way of of participating in retirement and not just looking at it as the end, but to instead stop and think, how am I going to to return the investment that society has given in me? How am I going to return that to the rest of the world? 
So meaning find some way of giving back? Yeah. And I I would imagine, though, and I struggle, the, one of the reasons I struggle with this, and one of the reasons I imagine you might struggle with this, is that I sort of feel like I'm already retired. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I, you know, I'm... Because you're not going 40s. to an office every day? I don't go to an office. I haven't gone into an office in 10 years, and I've been able to wake up and, and say, what are the projects that I'm going to work on today? Mm -hmm. And honestly, I was asking, I was out to dinner with some friends last night, and they said, you know, what, what are your plans for retirement? And they were talking to each other, and he said, well, I want to retire in five years. And I said to myself, self, you already retired. Like you already are making the choices that you want to make with how to use your time and give back in ways that are um, that are uniquely yours to give back. And you should probably just keep doing that as long as you're able to do it. It makes me happy to do those kinds of things. And I feel like the act of retirement is a thing that's sort of you know, or the the impression of what retirement is is sure. kind of a thing that's changing. What do you think? Well, there's your first problem, Bilbo, is you went to work. <laughs> If you had just stayed in your room and recorded a bunch of nonsense, yeah, then when you I'm love what you, you do, you don't work a day in your life. <laughs> That's right. Podcasting is a new gold rush, baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the amount of nothing we are getting for this podcast <laughs> is staggering. Um, no, I mean, the ideal thing to do, whether it's giving back, whether it's making a list of what if, if things that you've been putting off that you want to do, you want to, yeah, change your way of thinking about it. That it's not just an ending. Mm -hmm. It should be, ugh, I don't like saying this, but it should be a beginning to a new adventure. But I do think that that takes work. I think it's okay. It's smart, I think, to realize that you are anxious about it, mm -hmm. that it is something because it is something you have to act, uh, actively work on. I would think you really need mm -hmm. to, unfortunately, stare at it and look at what you want to do with your time, because the better landing pad you can have, especially for that next day, uh, because your body's yeah. going to get up for work. That's right. You're not going to sleep in. Your body's going right. to be there ready to go to the office. Don't have an actual office, but have something planned. What do you plan for, Tom? What is what are you going to do with that first day after you, quote, retire? Mm, Pete. There is a good chance because I am a 43 year old child. Let's be honest. Uh, the day after I finished the movie and I had one day off, I went to Universal Studios. <laughs> I treated myself <laughs> to a theme park. I won the Super Bowl by finishing a movie and then went to Disneyland. I would probably do that because it's yeah. very active. There's a lot of uh, people around. It's the opposite of going because I knew that I'd be coming down from the movie. You spend two weeks in these intense relationships with a bunch of strangers who you become sort of best friends and then never see most of them again. That's just mm -hmm. how movie making works. So I knew I wanted to not be home alone in my place. So right. I would say, I guess one way to say it is travel, treat myself to something that isn't insane. I don't know if I would go to like Hawaii, if that's where I've always wanted to go the very next day, but yeah, yeah. plan something nice to treat yourself. I doubt that Bilbo enjoys uh, theme parks as much as I do. No one should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do. I absolutely do. I do. Okay, oh, good. Yeah. No, I feel, feel like if there is a retirement in my future, it's it's going to end with like uh satisfying bowel movement <laughs> and uh a trip to a, a a trip to some sort of a a, a park of entertainment. Yeah. Uh, maybe some sort of VR thing. Yeah, I'd like to escape, that's fun. right? I'd like to escape. But I, I, I got to bring it back to, you know, the experts in the field. Uh, and he, we have uh, a psychologist and gerontologist, Ken Dickvold from Emeryville, California, who writes uh, for uh, a, a, a AARP. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, you get mailings from them now, don't you? Uh, who says you need to take time to think about the boxes of who you used to be. Uh, following your retirement. And it's okay to stop and unpack them, right? Unpack them and, and digest who that guy was after you retire. And then uh, you need to start thinking about what 
these new empty boxes are going to look like for your next chapter and and find a, a sort of a metaphor for growth that works for you something that you can you can figure out how to um, how to how to channel your energy into new relationships new projects new friends definitely look for um, a new social group one that can that you find is is replenishing because it's exhausting like picture um, your to, retirement to as a ship and the lost. sailing is more the sails are more time and the oceans are hobbies public schools public schools i just wanted to do another <laughs> that's my metaphor for growth uh, so I, you, there are uh, also co- companies that help with this. Uh, as I mentioned, this uh, fellow Dickwald says uh, that his company is actually called Age Wave, mm. uh, and this is the part Catch that it. I find a little bit. Um, I don't know. I'm not thrilled with this this timeline here. Uh, Dickwald says that that discomfort that you're feeling, Bilbo, it's going to last about 18 months. What? Yeah. Well, yeah. Don't- Write that I know. down. Age well, wave. here's the thing. This is why I say it out loud. 18 months. Because you know at the end of 18 months, it's over on average. Oh, I see. And Dickwald says, your level of happiness will soar after That's that point. Right. But you have to go through and experience this valley of despair before you can actually... Uh, soar out of it. And that's what you have in your future when you realize that there are things that you've wanted to do all your life that you haven't been able to do. And this chapter is going to let you do it. And I bet you could get it down to like eight. Yeah. No, that's... Don't take that as a a, a real line. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it can be... You can do it in an afternoon if you get your stuff together. Yeah, right. You know, I mean, maybe I was mentioned he was uh, with ADHD. Maybe take your foot off the brake there and stop taking the meds. Then you won't even see time passing anymore. <laughs> Go into that hyper focus zone and, uh, you know, you'll catalog all your CDs and uh, you, you've probably got 50 years of old photos and slide film that you need to to uh, digitize. Uh, that'll take you some time. Think of all the cleanup you can do. So much cleanup. This is how we get sued, Pete. (laughs) This is a What's That Smell exclusive service, is the What's That Smell retirement cleanup service. (laughs) Oh, he's going to go to other, he or she, I'm sorry, he's going to go to other people's houses. Well, that just means (laughs) she or he. That's not what I was thinking at all, but it's genius. Because she or he is just a custodian then, Pete. This is... (laughs) That's not a retirement. <laughs> They've gotten a new job as a janitor. Look, this is new not in the work. What's That Smell app is you can farm yourself out as a <laughs> as a What's That Jeez. Smell retirement cleanup artist. But you're not going to clean somebody's house, Tom. That's not how it works. Oh. You're actually going to take on the projects that need to get. You're going to uh, take on, you're going to polish a lot of silver and maybe then sell it on eBay. It's all the stuff that you know other people have been dying to do but haven't had time to do it. Now you get to do it <laughs> because you're so retired. you're made. What are you doing? The only way to do this and not be retired is you can't accept money for it. <laughs> and do the stuff that they don't want to do and then leave. For, this is a terrible retirement for free. But terrible it's going to be great no, because terrible. we're going to have reviews in the app of your performance. So you'll have none of the compensation, but all of the judgment of your former employer. <laughs> Congratulations. Look, I have to bring it back to Bilbo, and I want to go out on his closing line because I love that line so much. All that is gold does not glitter, and and not all those who wander are lost. And and is that from uh, Tolkien? It, it is from Tolkien, yeah. and I want to read uh, the entire poem. This is a Tolkien had, had written this, and it's about uh, Strider, right? It's a, before we kind of meet the strider and and so we get to learn kind of who he is and the rest of the poem goes like this all that is gold does not glitter not all those who wander are lost the old that is strong does not wither deep roots are not reached by the frost from the ashes a fire shall be woken a light from the shadows shall spring renewed shall be blade that was broken the crownless again shall be king that's going to be you bilbo it's going to be you, Bilbo. And <laughs> I've already set up your account on the What's That Smell app. Don't so do you it. You can start. Don't yes, do it, Bilbo. It's actually. Mm-hmm. Bilbo, don't do yes. it. <laughs> it's at crownlessshelbyking.com. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us for this episode. Today's tune is Blondie by Modern Aquatic. Coming up next week. 
I mean, she just solved cold fusion, right? <laughs> like it was amazing. Or I'd love to see your pretty face. Ugh, why would I say that? I'm not going to say that. <laughs> now I have anxiety about that. <laughs> Love to see your pretty face. You go to your hotel door and you open it and he's sitting out there waiting for you. And yeah, has that's been all weird. along. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's got weird. like a printout from MapQuest. I'm like, how did you, <laughs> what do you, is MapQuest even a thing? Until then, I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Tommy Mess the Third. Thank you so much for downloading. We will be back next week for our season closer on What's That Smell? <laughs>